here, uh, basically from the science field. So I requested how to connect this science with the humanities. So he, I think he will bridge this two different disciplines, science and humanity. So I yesterday I requested to uh, Dr. Saab and he happily accepted this challenge and ready to deliver the lecture on this particular topic. Besides this uh, innovative thinking, he has uh, just a brief about himself that he did his PhD from Japan, Kochi University, Japan, uh, in the field of marine biology. And he did his MSc uh, from the University of Madras. Despite various projects he is handling at present, he has also awarded from various at the national and international level from various agencies. So there is a long list of that. I am not going to discuss that. I welcome you, sir, in this course, Mr. Course, under the scheme of human rights education funded by you. So please welcome. So thank you, Gurdiv, and thank you all the participants for filling up this uh, questionnaire. Uh, I totally appreciate it and I tell you the background of this also. So I am planning to do this survey in all over India in some 10,000 sample size to see the public acceptance of the motion. So I will let you post if you are interested in contact me about the outcome probably it will take like next 6 months. And this is like a, you know, the first survey I just want to see that it will work or not. So I can show the statistics of it. So my talk here is entitled Evolution and Humanity. Before that, my first question to you all is what is your goal of life? So you can think about it. What is the goal of life? So many times I also follow myself, right? So thinking about my my ultimate goal of life, I right? am going to die. If you like anybody, like any mortal being, we are all going to die, right? So what would be the goal of your life? So you can think about it and choose one of these. So could be many, right? Which one would you prioritize? You might be love, happiness, health, and longevity money and material position. Some people are working for money, while people are more, uh, they would like to say that health and longevity is the first preference. Or happiness is the first preference number one. Or love, or fame and fortune. Like the scientists, you know, most of the scientists are for the fame and fortune, right? They want to, to name the stars after them, or they want to name the plants after them, like what I do you know, for my algae. I've found three algae in my life, so I haven't named them after me, but I, you know, my surname is appended on the binomial of the, those are name. Pleasure, pleasure seekers, hedonists, many are pleasure seekers, sex, charity, belief in God. How many of you say simply, you know, be confident, just lift, uh, lift your hand, uh, you know, love. You know, which one, the love is the, the number one priority. How many of you agree love is the, your first priority? I see, Chitin is the only guy. Happiness, how many of you? So many of you are after happiness, health and longevity, yes, many of you, money and material positions, yes, there are still many, fame and fortune, yeah, there are some of you, pleasure, pleasure, right, sex, only one guy, yeah, you know, after sex, charity, you know, helping others, you know, oh, I'm surprised to see very less of you are after charity, believe in God, yes, some of you, Right, so this is something called teleological inquisition in philosophy, the formal philosophy is called teleology, right? So purpose of life, what is the purpose of life? That is what comes under the name of the teleology. Now coming to the philosophies of life, there are many philosophies and especially on the Western philosophy, people are talking about the life, right? What is the meaning of life? What is your ultimate life ambitions or dreams? And that all comes under the name of the ontology, that is philosophy that deals with the meaning of existence. I exist. Felix first exists. And what is the meaning of my existence? Why did I born in this planet Earth? There are, you know, I'll just brief about the stoicism. That is after the zero of citrium, that is in the Greek. So they seek the tranquility of mind. So I just want to be happy. You know, I want to be tranquil. There by happiness and that is the way of life. And I identify myself as a stoic. I'm so much fascinated with the Bodies. And cynics, after Greek philosopher Antisthenes, what he believed in renunciation of material positions and living like a hermit, 
you know, giving the example, you can say in Himalayas, right? Even in our ancient Hinduism, we, we're not in ancient, right? Even in, uh, you know, in Hinduism, there are so many hermits. So they do not believe in material possessions at all. They just want to go back to the nature, right? And live like an animal. The Epicureans, after the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, he had contributed a number of theories, right? Pythagorean theory in the mathematics as well. Embrace material wealth, fame, and fortune, right? That is what he is after. Like some of you have, uh, you know, raised your hand if I ask you about, you know, the money and material possessions. So I would say that you guys are Epicureans, right? Then hedonists see pleasure, all forms of it, as the ultimate goal. As you can see, sex or pleasure, all of these are hedonists, right? They're seeking that one. So, what is your ultimate goal when there is no consensus, right? People are arguing this is better than that, that is better than that. just the way that religions are arguing, right? This is our ultimate goal. So the, the Islamism is our ultimate goal of Hinduism or Christianity, with some number of religions. This is my interesting, you know, probably one of my uh, most interesting ways. Can you guess what it is? The three lines here, right? Four lines, one dot. Anyone? Someone might have seen this image. It was a very famous image by, captured by, you know, Voyager spacecraft. That is NASA's voyage. It's called Pale Blue Dot. This is our Earth. This is the planet Earth, right? This is a place where we all live in. Six billion kilometers away that the, the Voyager captured in 1990. You know, a few months ago, it was the 15th anniversary of this famous image. And looking at this image, a very famous writer and an astronomist from the US, Carl Sagan. Most of you might have heard his name, right? Carl Sagan and his fam famous, there's so many books that he has written. So, uh, the Carl Sagan has said, uh, this statement is very interesting. It's, you know, it just captured, just penetrate your mind. So, this such a small corner of a pixel, right? So visited by, uh, you know, endless qualities which are inhabitants of just one corner of this pixel on scarcely indistinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. So a corner of just a small pinch drop pixel, right? So this pixel is our home, what we call the Earth, where all of the frequent misunderstanding, how eager they are to kill each other, how fervent their hatreds, our posturing, our imagined self-importance, the delusions that we have some privileged position, right? Or do we have privileged position in the universe? The Earth? Earth is the center of the universe or not? Or are the human beings the top of the ladder? The biodiversity ladder? We are the top, top of control of supremacy that we are controlling all other animals and plants together. So privileged position in the universe challenged by this point of pale light. is a lower challenge by just this pale blue light, right? It's called pale blue dot. So the question here is that do we really have a privileged position in this universe? So see, this is one of my photo, you know, I, I do take some amateur photography as well. This is like photo that I've taken in Japan. Uh, it's a sunset in the Ashram and it's featured in the National Geography. Sunset and sunrise. Are these real or not? You know, you can see it. People say, if you can see, you believe it, right? So sunrise is real. Sunset is real, this is a sunset, again. it's real, but no. These are mere illusions. Sun neither rises nor sets. I, we used to think like that. Earth is the center and everything is going around. Sun is going around. No, it's rising in the east and setting in the west. So that is what you call geocentrism. The view is called geocentrism. That the earth is the center of the universe. That is pre copernicanism and then after that it's post copernicanism is heliocentrism where sun is the center of at least our solar system that is a profound theory culminated by this guy called copernicus that is nicolas copernicus is an italian astronomer he falsified ptolemaic geocentrism by something called scientific methodology right and he put for the theory of heliocentrism so he did not go right beyond the solar system like this pale blue dot, you know, like the Voyager spacecraft. But being here in our Earth, this planet Earth, this pale blue dot, he was able to say for clear that Earth is just moving around the sun. He proved this through something called the scientific methodology, right? What is the scientific methodology that everybody should be at least be aware of, right, as a public. 
So this is nothing but logical, rational, systematic, reproducible, empirical and evidence-based methodology to test the hypothesis in question. So if I say that Earth is merely you know, moving around the Sun, I should be able to reproduce my hypothesis, I should be able to test it. And it is logical, you know, there is a syllogism, like for example, you know, deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. I'm not going too deep about it, but these are all philosophical concepts, right? If I say that all individuals are mortal, Felix is mortal. So I can say for sure Felix is going to die soon, right? So that sort of deductive reasoning is what you call the logic. It comes under the reins of the logic. Scientific methodology involves the observations, experiments, and statistical hypothesis testing. These are not evidence based. This is not just that, you know, subjective. You know, that's very important. Proving or disproving is a concept of falsifiability. That is after Karl Popper, again, is a British philosopher of science. And you might have heard his name, Francis Bacon, a star word of the British he's a British philosopher. He has written novel or piano in 1620. So most of the scientific methodology is developed after the publication of this novel or piano. Pseudoscience and science, you should be very clear that this distinction exists. Pseudoscience and science. What is a pseudoscience? It has got none of the elements of the scholarly scientific methodology. Instead of logic and reason, it tries to appeal to emotion. You know, like so popular, what you watch in the TV, right? It lets, lets you cry, lets you laugh. These are all emotion. They will never appeal you to the reason or logic, pure logic. So, emotions such as mysteries and miracles. So many mysteries you may have seen that Bermuda Triangle mystery, right? Or miracles. None of these have any scientific background. Irrational anecdotal records, right? So, some of these examples are UFOlogy. You might have heard that, right? Unidentified flying objects. Right, or the disc, right, flying disc. So, as aliens, people believe in that. Bermuda Triangle mystery, the big food was a sketch, or uh, you know, uh, Yeti, Himalayan Yeti, right? Alchemy, right? Alchemy is conversion of uh, unnovel material elements to novel, like gold or silver. Polygraph, the light testing device. You know, many of the Indians do believe the polygraph, the light tester, is scientific. It's not scientific, it's absolutely pseudoscientific concern. Ordinary medical practices, Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, Homeopathy, Telepathy, Reiki, Acupuncture. No, none of these are science, these are not evidence based. Astrology and other predictive systems of divination, such as ESP, extrasensory perception, clairvoyance, Illuminati, predictions of Nostradamus, you know, the famous deep predictor, right? So he People say that most of his predictions were right, even including the 9 11, he predicted it right, but absolutely ridiculous. This actually makes no sense at all. If you use the simple statistics, you can really disprove that these predictions were absolutely wrong. Hoxes, conspiracy theories, supernatural concepts, etc. There are lots of things. I, I can actually spend two or three lectures on, only on the hoxes. For example, moon landing hoax. Americans never landed on the moon. There are many people perpetrated this kind of hoax that the Apollo landing uh, is absolutely false. So these are the false itself is uh, a non-science. So the difference here, humanities and science, I'm not saying that humanities are not scientific. No, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that humanities are the studies of human culture. We're looking at human being, the culture of the human being, including history, languages, law, literature, performing arts, philosophy, psychology, religion, these are all looking for human being, right? Centered on human being. So these are all have something called anthropocentric perspective. That they're all looking at centered on the human being, our existence, our contribution, right? But methodology is mostly critical or speculative. There is no hardcore so like science, you know, there is no empirical methodology adopted by uh, the, the you know, for example, history. Histories are always looking at anecdotal, you know, evidence is the uh, uh, writings, right? That presumably probably is a very old uh, text, but we have no hard proof on it. But there is something about pseudo humanity as well. Pseudo humanity, for example, is history deeming something that the Holocaust period, you know, Holocaust that happened in 1941 to 1945 in uh, Germany, right? That Nazis have, uh, you know, uh, it's a genocide that Nazis have committed, right? To the, the Jews in uh, Germany. So people say that the Holocaust never existed. So this sort of absolute denial of the history. Now that it's not a very, very, you know, pre-historical time that this 
Holocaust happened, we have Excel record. And still if you say that the Holocaust did not happen, then that is a pseudo history or a pseudo humanity. But that is different from the historical revisionism, right? I'm not going that. But uh, what Shakespeare said in Hamlet is very interesting, that there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes so. If I say that astrology is bad, no, you don't have to accept it. You know, it's, it's all about your thinking, your perspective, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's very important to see another person's perspective as well, right? So, applied sciences also have the so-called fallacy of anthropocentrism. So, for example, medicine, pharmacy, or pharmacology, agriculture, or aquaculture, engineering, biotechnology, all are after what benefit of human beings that we can get in, in the society. How to improve the human society in, in the nature, right? That is what they all are looking for. They are also for a fallacy for anthropocentrism. It's a fallacy. Or it's glorified synonyms. You might have heard humanitarianism, right? There are many famous, uh, you know, Hollywood actor, actors and actresses are humanitarian. You know, big short business people, uh, for example, Bill Gates are all philanthropic, right? Are in these fallacies the are we the center of the universe or do we have a privileged position in the universe? That is what uh, this talk is all about, right? Geocentrism versus anthropocentrism. These two concepts are having certain similarities. So, Earth is the center of the universe. In the case of anthropocentrism, it's a human being is the center of the universe. And uh, both have a rationale that, in this case, geocentrism, you live in this planet. And because you live, this is your world. The universe surrounds you the same way you are a human being. Right? And you deserve a privileged position among other living things. Because you see the things from your own perspective, but you don't see the perspective of bacteria, for example, or a cat or a dog. Right? You just see the world around you in your own perspective. This is the problem here. Right? This is related to a so-called transformation bias. It's a psychological term or it's a cognitive bias. Some of you, if you're interested, you can talk more into it. You know, creation myth, probably you might have heard of this one that in the Western philosophy, mostly it's in the Christian philosophy, right? Christian theology, it's not a philosophy actually. Earth is only 6,000 years old. No more than 6,000. That is why I asked one question here, is the Earth older than 10,000 years or not? Yes, it is older than 10,000 years. I just want to see how many of you are accepting, probably all of you are accepting, because we in India, we never had this problem with this particular, uh, you know, evolution, that the Earth is immensely old. We always know that it's old. Do you know that Cambridge University now regarded as the top university right on 17th century, going back to just three centuries, 300 years, the VC of Vice Chancellor of the Cambridge University is John Lightfoot. What did he precisely calculate? The age of Earth is 6,019 6, years. Such a blunder, isn't it? Because it is all of, uh, you know, based on the capitalism, right? The Bible, biblical anecdotal evidence. Entire life on earth created as it is by the God. So we are not evolving, we are just static human beings created as it is by the God. That is what the religious purpose. God made the world for us. So what is the purpose of this? Or for the human beings. The entire world is created for us. Earth as well as its life is static. It's not moving or evolving. That is what it says. Right? Uh, so uh, let me diverge briefly to the Hinduism. So in, in the case of Hinduism, Right? According to Vedas, Earth is 1.97 billion years, that is around 197 crore years. Right? So it's more or less coming in terms with the current consensus, that is around 457 uh, crore years old. Earth is, right? So Vedas is kind of hitting the target, though it is quite distant though. It's regard the cosmos is eternal, recurring and cycling. Right? It's not static, it's cycling. Which is trying to cross the current scientific understanding that the Earth underwent ice ages right? and the warming ages. Right? These are called glaciers, you know, uh, periods, right? Pralayas and Mahapalayas, you can see that in the Vedas, right? What are these? These nothing but extinctions where biodiversity have mass extincted. For example, KT extinction event. If you have seen Jurassic Park, probably you might know what this KT extinction event is. It's a huge event that, you know, almost 60 percentage of the, the life on planet Earth has simply wiped off, probably attributed to some, you know, asteroid impact, and including dinosaurs were all extinct, got extinct by that vertical extinction. 
and I'm sure everybody knows what the Shavadara is and the 10 incarnations of Vishnu, right? It goes through, it's very interesting. Matsya Purma, you know, fish, tortoise, to ball, to man, lion. So just forget this one. Then dwarf man and then the man with axe. It portrayed vertebrate evolution. Strikingly portrayed, right? And the term strikingly concerned with the Shavadara was said by none other than H.P.S. Haldane, the famous British uh, so the, the, there is a strong contrast between West and East. So that is why I'm more interested in the survey because I want to see how Indians take the concept of evolution. No, no surveys have ever taken in India, right? So as you know, the, that hobby self-importance I was telling earlier about the self-importance preached by the world's religions. An elusive privileged position of humanity was completely torn apart by the Charles Darwin's theory of evolution that he first uh, you know, promulgated in the year 1859. Right? What did he say? Human beings as we know them develop from earlier species of animals. So there is exactly one question in this survey that we did develop, no, we did evolve from earlier animals including apes. Right? We are evolved from apes and that the entire earth of life can be interpreted in a giant tree of life, like a, like a tree. You know, outside, if you go outside this campus, you can see some trees, right? So like a tree, the entire diversity of earth, including plants, animals, and microbes, are all interconnected. To the root, the root is the origin of life, right? So this is something called principle of common descendant. All are uh, evolved from just one individual, right? The entire uh, biodiversity of earth plant form from just one particular organism, that is what we call it as Neomura, yeah, right? Entire life on earth is later and can be drawn on the tree of life. So this sort of a tree-like depiction with major six kingdoms of life. This is the origin of life, then these are all bacteria, these are, you know, animals and fungus, while these are all plants, right? So. Theory of evolution by natural selection. Now coming to the term natural selection, what is that? So as the name says, right, etymology, just look at the, how the name sounds like. So it's selection, you're selecting, like picking of mangoes, right? You're selecting, but instead of you, it's nature. Nature is selecting some individuals out of many. Right? That exactly is what the natural selection is. So nature selects the best fit individuals of a population. Population is nothing but collection of you know, individuals like you people. You know, we are a population, right? We can say that the population of India, right? Indians as such share a lot of similarity rather than Pakistan, right? So we can say that Indian form one population, Pakistan is form another population, right? So nature serves the best fit individuals of a population that are well adapted, adapted to available ecological resources, right? So what is available in this resource? So, for example, here we are adapted to the resources of particular region. Right? We are not adapted to the resources offered by tropics. You know, the, the real equatorial tropics, for example, in Kerala, you know, the, the kind of flora and fauna is different from the flora and flora and fauna is nothing but plants and animals. So plants and animals of this region is different from that of some other places. Right? Like kind of Japan is very cold, here it is not that cold, it's arid. Right? So these are adaptations to the local resources. Right? So nature selects a best fit individual. One example here is, a, have you heard this one name, Kopi Luwaka? Kopi Luwaka is nothing but it's a coffee. It's a world's most expensive coffee, right? very expensive. That what is this coffee all about? This is a climate, palm civet, right? Asian palm civet. So this particular, uh, you know, cute little creature, he eats these berries, it's a coffee berries. But he picks very juicy, right? He takes only the best possible berries available in the nature. Not the very bad berry, he will never pick it. He is very smart in that way, right? We don't know which berry is best or worst unless we crack open and drink in the coffee, right? But palm spit knows it very well. So he picks up the best berries, then what do you do? He eats and then he defecate, right? So the feces of the palm civet, the berries are picked up and process it to form this most expensive exotic coffee, coffee you want, right? So this is something like how the nat natural selection works. The nature is selecting the best individuals for the benefit and for the ultimate survival. So let me just explain to you, this is something called circum 
navigation, right? You are, you are traveling all around the world. So this one line in this sort of Mercapta project means that this is navigating all around the world. So this is a navigation of HMS Beagle, Her Majesty ship. So this is how by the convention of the UK, the, the name of ships HMS. So Beagle is the name of a ship where Charles Darwin traveled. As you know, this is this island is called the UK. He went all the way to this is what? Where is this? Brazil, right? Brazil to Argentina, right? Chile, right? This area is Chile. This is Bolivia, right? He made a lot of uh, things. This is Peru, and from Peru he went all the way to Galapagos Island, right? Galapagos Island is in Pacific Ocean. This is Atlantic Ocean. From Galapagos Island he went to New Zealand. Right, and then Australia, and this particular place is called Darwin in Australia, right? We went all the way to, to Madagascar, but we didn't come to India though, right? We went all the way to Madagascar and then to uh, you know, Cape of Good Hope in, uh, uh, you know, in uh, uh, South Africa, then we went ultimately, eventually went back to the UK. And he observed, uh, you know, very starkingly interesting biogeographic patterns, and he spent the next 27 years develop a theory, the theory he said, uh, you know, theory of evolution. So he read papers, Malthus, right? So most of, some of you are from economics background, so you know what this Malthus is, right? David Malthus, right? So, uh, and his theory is on uh, demographics, right? So this Malthus, Darwin read the papers on economics also, so that is very interesting, you know, uh, during uh, uh, his year, his time, almost uh, three, three, hundred years back, scientists do read economics and history papers. So a trend that is totally missing these days. We don't read these days. So his theory is something called descent with modification. That descent is nothing but your offspring, your kids. So your kid is not exactly like you, right? There is some difference. So that is something called modification. And that modification results in variation, right? So nature selects the best variant out of many. That is exactly what you call the natural search, right? Species that diverge from a common ancestor were at first very similar. For example, this BC are diverse from this particular form, right? BC are very, very similar. Then either B or C with A, right? These are extremely very different, right? Number one here is the origin of life. And this drawing is a very famous drawing by Charles Darwin himself in his notebook. So what did he observe? It's very, very simple. The concept is really simple. I want everybody to be well-versed with this concept at least. He observed that overproduction, that we, the species produce overly, right? Uh, beyond the capacity that the, 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 the resources of nature can offer. So populations of all species have the ability to produce more offspring than the nature can possibly support them, right? So, uh, with the food, space and other resources, that makes struggle for existence inevitable. You have to struggle in order to survive, that not everybody can survive. These are our sperms competing each other for just one form, right? So, just an analogy, right? But this is not how the natural selection works. But it works in a bigger level, levels of individuals of a population. You are all you know, competing each other for winning the race. Second observation is that all none of two individuals are same. All of your faces are different, just like you know, these are nothing but ladybugs, right? These ladybugs patterns are all different. So this that is what I call the variation. Individuals of the species vary. So he combined these two variations. As I told you, power production is from an idea he borrowed from Malthus. The individual variation combine these two together to form differential reproductive success. Only the best adapted individuals of a population can be able to attain the reproductive age. Reproductive age in the sense that you can the age at which you have sex and make babies, right? Individuals with traits best suited to the local environment of adaptations thrive. Only those individuals which are well adapted to the local resources can be able to survive. That is exactly what you call the natural selection, right? So coming back to my first point here, what is the goal of your life? Which one should you prioritize, the, you know, uh, out of this love and happiness and as per, as per the evolution? The answer is sex and reproduction, only you are right, you know? What is your name? Yes? Yes, only you are, you are the right one, in light of the theory of evolution, right? 
So though our purpose of life is very simple, all individuals are surviving to find a mate, to have sex and you know make babies. Why are you making babies? To transfer your genes to them, right? For uh, perpetuation of the species, you are transferring your genes to your babies, right? So that your genes will survive in the gene pool of the uh, species, right? After becoming parent, then what is your purpose of life? You know, I'm the father of two daughters. I have two daughters. Now I can say that my life is complete. I can simply go die by myself. No, but I have to support my kids till they find their mate, have sex, make more babies, right? So that cycle continues. So that is exactly how the evolution works. If you would not find a mate or too recalcitrant, you're too choosy, you know, I want the best possible lady, the most pretty lady or most handsome boy. Uh, I, know I cannot find a suitable way. Then what is that? Or you could not make a kid. Unfortunately, there are people uh, you know, who cannot make a baby. Then your life is as good as a corpse. Uh, like a dead person. That is uh, very blunt. That statement is very blunt. But that exactly is how you should work. Right? So, some example here. The evolution action. Speciation due to selective breeding. These all varieties of you know, cabbage, Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, uh, kohlrabi, right? All these are formed from just this particular plant of wild mustard. That we choose it and then we breed it for our own uh, benefit. But similarly, you can actually draw one image of different breeds of dogs or cats. You know, these are all breeds of you know of the dogs, but these are all for uh, belongs to just one particular species called Canisthopus. But these are different species. And who made these species? Because we, we choose it and we breed it. Right? Instead of human being choosing it, in the case of natural selection, it's nature. Right? That analogy with artificial selection is exactly how Charles Darwin himself explained what the natural selection is in his book of origin, right? Origin of species. Or look at this maze, right? Maize corn, you know, corn, right? These are nothing but corn. After eating, you discard it, right? And if you look at the archaeology, lot, lot, lot of years back, like 10,000 years back, corn sizes were very small. Now, if you look at that, corn sizes have become very high because we choose only the best yielding corn and then we selectively hybridize it to have the best yielding corn. Are you getting the point? This is what you call the artificial selection. Another example would be elephant tusks. New research are saying that the dust of the elephant, you know, the horn of the elephant are getting smaller. Why are this getting smaller? Because we hunt. The, the longest dust elephant we hunt. So for elephants, if you wear the elephant shoes, and if you think about how elephant thinks, having long dust are no more advantages for them. Right? If you have a long dust, then what will happen? Human beings will hunt you, they will kill you. So it's always advantages to have a dust is smaller. So the dust size is getting shorter, right? That is one another important. And this is an excellent, uh, you know, evidence that the Carl Sagan he said in his famous uh, TV series for Cosmos. I suggest you all go and check out the Cosmos available in the internet these days, right? So what is this? This is a crab. You know, the crab found in ocean marine sea, right? Uh, these are uh, deep jolly crabs. So you can eat it, right? Any anyone of you have a crab? Yes, all of you have this crab. So this crab, right? If you look at this crab, crab it's very interesting, right? You can see a face there, a fierce samurai face. This crab is for Heikia Japonica. It's a famous crab in Japan. Right? Why this crab has got this particular samurai face? There is a myth associated with this particular crab. And even the name such as Heikia, right? This Heiki is a clan of samurai, samurai man. Right? This Heiki clan got defeated by Meiji clan, another samurai, in uh, 10th century AD, Christian era 10th century, uh, famous in a battle, you know, battle of uh, Kyoto. Heiki got defeated, and what Meiji did? Meiji, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, you know, cut through these guys, this Heiki, right? Executed them, and then they throw the head on the Sea of Japan. And after throwing that, if you get this sort of crab, then the Japanese fishermen used to say, these are nothing but faces of or spirits of Heiki maniacs. You know? 
So then what they do? They simply throw it, you know, only eat spirits. You know, if you if you eat spirit, then the spirit will, you know, be enspirit you, right? You will become a ghost. So they, they are stupefied to have this sort of you know crap. So they throw it. And now, you know, uh, something like empathy, right? You're putting the shoes of the crap. If you think about how crap things, if I have a shaving of this sort of fierce samurai barrier, my chances of survival is higher. And it's a very smart way of thinking. And who thinks it? It's not actually the crap thinks it. It's not that we think it. It is, it is how the natural selection thinks. Because, you know, we are simply throwing this crap to see the chances of survival and reproduction are increased. So it's differential, reproductive, survival. And this is called assortative mating, not dissortative, random mating. Right? These sort of crabs mate only with the chances of mating this crab with another crab of similar nature is increased. Because we are throwing out these crabs with see. And we are eating only those crabs which do not have this face. See how beautiful this is. But this is again another example of uh, the natural selection, right? So this is yet another proof here. These are nothing but more. Kettle word more. It's a very famous example here. This is in England. Uh, these more before the industrial revolution happened in 18th century in England. So a lot of you know these are nothing but lichens, right? The lichens are plant and algae, right? Fungus and algae. These are association of fungus and algae. So these sort of lichens are there. So there are so many lichens on the tree bark, right? And the two kinds of moth here, one is black moth and one is pepper moth, like a pepper colored moth. In this way, the black moth is a rare mutation, rare variant. Most of the moth were pepper moth. Why? Most of the moth are pepper moth because of camouflage, right? They can able to hide, seek refuge in this sort of uh, lichen so that birds of prey cannot be able to catch them, right? If I ask you to identify what is inside this, probably none of you can able to see that there is a moth hiding here, right? So that is why their survival rate is much higher, just like the IKEA Japanica story that I told you. But then after that, what happened? The Industrial Revolution happened in the 18th century. That resulted in coal and soot, right? These are just nothing but black carbon particles deposited on the, the, the tree bark. So all the tree bark becomes darker. So the black varieties now have advantage. They can seek refuge in the soot, while the pepper do not have an advantage. Birds can able to pick them up, right? So now suddenly the population started moving towards the black, right? The proportion of black moth increased by pepper moth increase. Evolution happened. After this, you know, uh, because of uh, uh, better, you know, strategies adopted by England in the 20th century, this suit begins to disappear, and now old story coming back here. The black moths are now vulnerable, right? Pepper moths are a lot more adapted, right? They, are, uh, they can seek refuge in the tree like and that is exactly what you call that one, right? The, 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 the natural selection. This is yet another picture I took on it, you know, last week in Bhatinda, a place where I stayed in a, a house with party. This is a beautiful flower, isn't it? Who chooses the beauty of the flower? Who decides which flower to pick up from, right? This is nothing but, you know, insects, the pollinators. The pollinator who choose which is the best flower, right? Which is the tastiest flower, which is you know tastiest in the sense the nectar, the flower produces nectar, right? So the, the, the insects coming to have the honey. Right? And which flower is the most fragrant flower? So these are all choose by insect pollinators. And pollinators are very important because pollinators transfer the pollen from one flower to another, and that is how they have sex. They make babies, right? And the flower, if you think in the flower's perspective, you know, you need to feed honey to these pollinators, right? You have to feed honey. But you have to be very, very, very careful not to overwrite these pollinators. It's kind of a bribing, right? Quid pro quo, right? You are paying for the services, right? Because it's kind of a mutualistic understanding. You need 
you know, the pollinators for reproduction and pollinators need these flowers for honey, right? But you cannot bribe them too much. If you bribe them too much, then what will happen? They become lethargic, they become lazy, they will not go to another flower. No, that is not what you want. You want these pollinators to transfer the pollen from one flower to another flower. You cannot feed them too little also, right? If it's very little, then they will simply avoid the flower one to the other. They have to come back to the same flower again, right? After the, the next day uh, or after one week, the same pollinators need to attract them. So you have to be, you know, uh, uh, you have to observe extreme prudence, like a good economist. So it's, it's kind of economy, isn't it? So how does nature's natural selection works? Do you know what this one is? Anyone? It's a kind of a bird, right? What is this bird? Anyone? No idea? Right, this is nothing but the bird, the, the same pale blue dot that I told you earlier. This is a famous uh, projection called the Maxian projection. So it's, it's a bird, accurate depiction of a bird, but if you, you know, you open from the southern hemisphere. So the northern hemisphere looks fine, but the southern hemisphere looks distorted. But Mercator projection is, you know, symmetric distortion. Only the equator is fine. Neither north pole or south pole is fine, you know, because these are, you know, disproportionately stretched in the normal Mercator projection. But in this case, this asymmetric distortion, right? This is a projection called Dimaxian projection by the famous engineer, uh, you know, uh, 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 American engineer, right? So, uh, what is that his name? For what is it? Uh, C60 is Fullerin, right? Buckminster Fullerin, Buckminster Fullerin, right? It's a Fullerin projection. So it's nothing but it's a storybook, the Arctic Cipher, right? It's, um, I have already completed, so um, I hope I can publish it in a few months if publishers are ready to accept it, right? This is a storybook for the kids I wrote it. And in which I depicted a story, a very interesting story of two, you know, two friends or two cousins running, escaping from the chasing tiger. So what is that these guys are doing now? They are escaping from the tiger. Tiger can run very fast, right? Like cheetahs can run like 120 kilometers per hour, right? Extremely fast run. And no human beings can run as fast as that. I'm not saying the entire story, but the catch here is that this guy, you know, the guy who is training in the run, his, his aim is not to outcompete the tiger, but he just wants to be alone in that race. He's, he's running to outcompete his cousin on this race to escape the tiger, the, the tiger. So why do I say that? His aim is just to outcompete him. So the moment he outcompete and when the moment the, the, the tiger catches this person, that's that's over. The entire story is over. And the, the tiger do not attack more than one individual at a time. But most of the prey predators are like that. They hunt the prey, only one prey, and then they leave the rest. Right? So here here the natural selection is happening at individual level. That is very important. The variation is the running speed. Right? And the fittest one is being selected. Here who is selecting? The tiger is selecting the fittest variety here. Right? It's not that running both, uh, you know, both uh, outrunning the tiger is their ambition, but the actual aim or purpose is to outrun each other. If we are competing against each other. If human beings as one population, we are competing against human beings. We are not competing against tiger or we are not competing against any other species. That is very important. We are not the top of evolutionary ladder, you know? We are just part of it. We are just part of the niche. We are not competing against other plants or animals or microbes. This is a very, very important lesson, right? You should know. This is another book on the Indian animals that I published. Uh, if you are interested, you can uh, otherwise you can check out my website as well. So this, this is something called arms race, like the normal defense arms race that we are doing, India and Pakistan is doing, right? Though so our arms race is not comparable with that of America, right? It's huge giant. America you can compare with arms race with America with that of China, right? They are now uh, in an arms race. Or American previous time America and Russia were in a big arms race. So evolution selects the fastest running predators fastest running place. If you look at the animal kingdom, the fastest ones, the top 10, the, the, the most fastest uh, you know, animals are either predators, like cheetah, tiger, lion, or prey, antelopes, deer. Why are they? They are the top runners, right? But, 
you know, evolution selects the fastest running. So there is a limit there. There should be some limit. You know, none of them can be able to achieve the max, the speed of light, that is, uh, speed of sound, that is 730 meter per second. So impossible to achieve that limit, right? And the limit is dictated or set by the economy of speed with lean and long limbs. You know, if you have lean and long limbs, you can run faster. But you know, there is disadvantage because the probability of having, uh, you know, a fractured limb is too much. You know, there is give and take, there is an economy there, right? So, in one budget, same way the personal budget works as well, right? So, in the personal budget, in one item, you cannot overly input all this money, right? Or in one share, you cannot in, in, invest enter your entire wealth in just one share, that is too risky, right? So the portfolio needs to be balanced, that way the economy needs to be balanced. Or increasing the height of trees to outcompete neighbors for maximum light power. So if you look at a forest canopy, there are you know, small grasses, then shrubs, trees. Why are the heights different? Because they are all competing uh, you know, for shadow. If one, uh, one individual becomes a bit higher, taller, then the shadow becomes a, a limiting factor. They also want to overcome it, right? It's all about competition, right? Happening in the category. But there is a limit set by the economy of higher photosynthesis. If tall, so if tall, the photosynthesis is higher. But the, the trees need to invest more resources towards building stronger, dignified vasculature for water transportation. For example, sequoia, right? The redwood trees, famous, the, the, you know, the tallest trees in the world. We have seen that in California, you know. Uh, these trees are extremely, you know, rigid, dignified trachea, they have got. So, you need to invest a lot of resources to build that kind of, you know, the, the cylon and phloem, that is vascular uh, tubes of this particular plant. So, there is an economy of give and take, right? There are so many evidences, including fossils, and lots of fossils are there, right? Like, uh, you can see that movie I, I told you earlier, you know, uh, Jurassic Park, to see the kind of, you uh, uh, coming back the fossils to life, right? There are so many fossil evidences on the biogeography evidence how the plants and animals distribute in our planet Earth. So this evidence is very important. Homologous and analogous structures are the, for example, you know, hip bone and base. You know, the base have got hip bone, right? This is actually hip bone and base. You can say that this is kind of a homologous structure to our own limbs because base or dolphins used to be a tetrapod. They used to be hippopotamus or very near to hippopotamus, not the animals in the, the, the theory of evolution. There are vestigial structures as well. For example, human tailbone. You have bone, not tailbones, right here. It's called cockets. And that help you nothing but if you, if you fall on these cockets, then it hurts you very bad and it will give you a lot of troubles, right? Or appendix, vermiform appendix, if you have it, right? Some of you might have uh, had it removed as well, right? Uh, you know, appendicitis. So these are these are you know, indications or vestiges of our own, you know, uh, our history, right? The, the evolutionary history of that. Then the embryology also gives you a, a, a very excellent proof for the evolution that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. It's a very famous, uh, uh, you know, statement by Ernst Haeckel, the famous German biologist. What it says, the phylogeny is nothing but the evolutionary pattern. Recapitulates ontogeny. Ontogeny is a way that an embryo develops, like a human embryo develops. If you look at that, the first two weeks, it looks like a fish embryo and human embryo are indistinguishable for the first two, three weeks, right? And after that, uh, a dog embryo and a human embryo becomes indistinguishable for the next two months at least. Then after three months, you know, uh, our, our embryo and chimpanzee embryo becomes indistinguishable. So it goes through all these patterns. So these are all the of evolution. Right? Origin of the universe, you can say that the, this is how the Big Bang is. The Big Bang happened around 15 billion years old, or 1,500 crore years old. Then comes the origin of solar system and Earth, that is 4.6 billion years old. Then origin of moon, the moon is actually from Earth. One huge Mars-sized planet hit the Earth. It's called Theia, and that impact is called giant impact that ejected Mars of Earth to the space. That turned to be the Moon, right? 
So that happened around about 4.5 billion years old, and this is what you call a deep, deep geological time. We have excellent evidence. We can able to trace back in history. So the, the geological history of Earth is watched by different eons. Right? So Hadean is the oldest one, then Archean, then Proterozoic, and this is current is called Phanerozoic. So Hadean, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth originated, right? So you can see that this is how. We have got accumulated vast amount of uh, you know fossil and biogeographic evidence for to support this particular uh, high resolution image of this geological time. Then, as you know very well, these continents are drifting apart as well as they are uniting, right? So this is the Pangaea that split to uh, you know Laurasian Gondwana in the late Jurassic period, right? Then, you know, Gondwana land, that is what a part of India is, right? So, India and Madagascar, this is Madagascar and this is India, right? This India and Madagascar collided. They drifted through the Tethys Sea, they collided with the Eurasian plate to form the continental drift that resulted in our Himalayas. And as you know, our Everest is slowing. Even every day, I mean, every day, yes, every hour, the Himalayas is growing, although the speed is extremely low. And that is exactly what we call the tech plate tectonics, right? The, the plates, there are so many plates, like this is Indian plate, this is Eurasian plate. This movement of plates are what is causing what earthquake that happened in the Nepal last week, right? So the team's contribution, our team, we are working on the process of evolution. We are contributing a number of findings uh, as well. For example, you know, the Tulsi, the Holy Basin, you know, we have sampled across the continent and we could able to trace that it originated in north central India. So how do we do that? We just have to sequence DNA and compare with other isolates using computational techniques. So we can trace that the Tulsi had its rule on uh, you know somewhere near Anaras or Maranasi, that is the area where this Tulsi is originated from. So uh, other contributions on end of phytic algae that we did it. And we also discovered new algae, the potential uses beneficial algae species we have found. And this is the first time we found that the phytic algae all through this, uh, you know, tracing the evolutionary, uh, uh, you know, evolutionary legacy through the DNA sequences. Uh, of late, three, three, uh, two, three weeks ago, we found this uh, blood drain history in Kerala, in Kerala as well as in South India as well as in Sri Lanka. You know, the rain, uh, you know, flows and the rain has blood color, you know, red color. Why is it the red color? So there's so many pseudoscientific claims were pro uh, proposed that this is because of the alien environment. And this is a divine miracle. There are so many stories propagated. But we, through the DNA sequence analysis, we could able to prove that these are nothing but spores of algae, you know, microalgal spores. And this is actually a very, a very interesting uh, mechanism employed by the algae to disseminate the spores in a very large geographical area at once so that it can grow from those areas, right? And we could able to trace the origin of this particular uh, species is from Europe, Central Europe. So it has drifted through, uh, you know, uh, uh, intercontinental clouds. So right here, if I ask you a question, the penicillin is an antibiotic. Right? Antibiotic is nothing but antibacterial chemical produced by living organism. So it's a micro producing antimicrobial system. That is exactly what I call the penicillin. So it was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. So after some 10 years, penicillin resistant microbes, so the microbes that can able to grow even if penicillin is given. So uh, now most of the pathogenic bacteria are resistant to original penicillin formulation. Now, now my, my question to you is, which among the following is true regarding the penicillin resistant bacteria? So first option A is that they existed before the invention of penicillin. They means penicillin resistant bacteria. Did they uh, you know, exist before the penicillin was invented? Or they evolved after the invention of penicillin? How many of you uh, agree? Number A is right, lift your hands. How many of you agree? B is right. Yes, many of you agree. B is right. But the answer is A. You know, uh, there is, uh, there is a is, you know, it's, it's not a tough to understand the evolution here. See, variations are spontaneous, caused by mutations in DNA. Mutations are not directed by selection, that is very important, right? Mutations are absolutely a random process. All nature does is to select the best fit variants. No? This is the same thing I can ask you 
you about the same question on the liquidator. Now we have shown liquidator, right? So did the mosquitoes resisted in liquidator that anti mosquito with liquidate exist before liquidator was invented? Yes. But the portion with the population was low. But after the liquidator was introduced, the proportion got higher. Are you getting the point? Yes or no? So another example could be trap on the rat. So uh, you know these days rats are very clever, right? You can be able to avoid the traps. Or insecticide, herbicide resistance. Everything can actually combine that with that, right? So uh, this is related to the uh, Salvador Luria, Salvador Luria and Max Delbrugs, you know, uh, uh, very, very, very uh, famous fluctuation test that they did uh, to see that you know, statistical pattern on the microbial So I'm not explaining the microbial time constraint. But again, there are so many philosophical issues also, right? So are the words static, ceaseless, universe, name and God, or the change is the dynamicity is the natural order? You know, it's dynamic, right? We are all evolving. We are not static in that you are sitting there, right? You are motionless, you are sitting, right? Are you static? No, you are supersonic actually. You are traveling at the speed of 1800 kilometer per hour. Supersonic, that is Mach 1.5 because you are moving towards the east. Earth is rotating, right? Nothing is static here, right? And there is no purpose. Purpose as in the God created the purpose, right? But we have function. You know, that's very important, right? So that is exactly what it is. So I, let me conclude this topic in a few slides, right? Uh, let me just... Uh, uh, did it come? Yeah, okay. I know that it's clear. Where is it? Has it come? Yeah. Yeah, ask it. Yeah, So this one, this anthropocentric principle has come to mediocrity principle that human beings have got actually no special privilege on this universe. That is a very important concept, right? So we are nothing but we are just part of evolution, right? We are not actually someone very special or very uh, very important in this universe, right? So there are a few more slides. Let me just come to the conclusion here, right? So you know this uh, the racism, as you can see, that race racism is actually happening in the world, right? So are these really blameful? But if you can see that the nature, the the use social animals, for example, ants. You can see the, the, the racist ants or even uh, the honeybee, you can see the racism is apparent in honeybee. The trolley problem is also a very interesting problem that one railroad trolley is actually running through. You have an option, you know, to save five people, but you just have to kill one person. You just have to push one person to the railroad to save five people. Can you push or that is an ethics, right? So you are killing one person to save five people. Can you do that, yes or no? Can you kill one person to save five people? Probably some of you say yes, you can kill. But my question is that what if this person is the son, daughter, father, mother? Impossible, right? So that is exactly what you call the altruism there. So altruism and terrorism is also quite related. So that is for the kamikaze, the Japanese kamikaze or the World War II, right? Uh, these are nothing but Pure implications of the terrorism. And the terrorism is highly subjective also. The term itself is extremely subjective. For example, we all adore this Nelson Mandela, right? Nelson Mandela is a Nobel laureate as well, a peace laureate, uh, Nobel laureate. But Mandela, you, you know, he, the Americans dragged Nelson Mandela for, for quite a long time. He used to be a terrorist according to the American perspective. Right? So we don't know about the terrorist of the current day, do we? get the Nobel Peace Prize or not, right? We really don't because these are all actually, uh, you know, subjective concept, uh, concepts, right? And also sexual cannibalism is also apparent, right? For example, this, uh, uh, you know, the uh, grasshoppers, male grasshopper after cooperating, the females eat it, right? So they're simply, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, sacrificing their life for what? Just for purposes to cooperate and make babies. Promiscuity is a natural order for a number of animals, including uh, you know, monahu and chimpanzee. While prostitution is legalized in many countries, as you know, age of consent is again very, very subjective. For example, Angola is 12. In India, in, in India, what? Anybody, niggas, age of consent, legally you can have sex. What age? 18, but now it is coming back to 16, yes. 
and Bahrain is 22. So there is no consensus exists. You know, group sex of orgy, these are all actually natural for one of those chimpanzees or even uncontacted tribes of human beings. Uh, you know, last year I went to Andaman Nicobar Islands. There is an island called North Sentinel. Nobody had ever touched or ever contacted those tribes. So here it is actually, uh, you know, very natural there. Again, it is subjective. While in gang rape, you know, whatever bad it is, but it is a natural order for the ducks, dolphins, and spiders. Now, mediocrity principle. We say that human beings are, have actually no privileged position at all. That is the mediocrity principle. But it doesn't go well with the morality, ethics, and human value system. That is very, very important. Now, I'm not coming into the language and uh, evolution that is a thing. The, you know, coming, coming here, see, right and left, right? There are two politics here. Rightist and leftist. If you group it rightist, these are the commonalities for all of these rightist politics. They are conservative, they are mostly religious, they are sexual monogamous, uniculturalist, they don't want mix up of culture, they are unilinguists, you know, they don't want many uh, languages together, right? They are racist, you can say, naturalist, but leftists are just the opposite of it, right? So Marxism versus natural selection are these natural selection to Marxism. So it is a welfare state of utopia is unnatural. Nature is not like a, a welfare state. You know, nature is not like that. There is an une unequal distribution of breath in the nature. That is our natural order. For example, here, you know, plants, various kinds of plants on the earth. These are not just equal plants, equal and even the uh, you know comparative uh, position the dish, ecological dish is not same. Or the animals, these are not equal, right? The, the power is not equal, the strength is not equal, nothing is equal, right? So if you go right, what will happen? The majority of rightist perceptions are not being expanded to this one specific adaptive selection mechanism that actually uses to minimize intra-population variability. So population variability is less if we do it a rightist between the race. So that way directly contributing speciation. So species is split into two. The human beings will be split into two or more species if it's rightist perspective. But in the case of left, it is scientific invention supposed to hybridize, that is mixing of different lineages, right? Populations from Brazil, for example, and Indians are mixed up. So diverging populations by means of multiculturalism, right? It's the same thing. Liberal sexuality and egalitarianism, right? So question is humanity want to split or no? That is a you know that strike question here, right? Left conflict here. So if I say what is the future of humanity if it's right, we are going to embrace naturalism, demod multiculturalism. We don't want so many cultures, right? In India, we are just in pure English, right? And then eventually set out for speciation. So India as such the population will become uh, you know, a new species, ultimately I'm saying after many thousands of years. But in the case of left, we are going to expose nurturism, right? Nature versus nurture. If that is nothing but science, right? We can even go into extra terrestrial colonization, right? Promote multiculturalism and we continue to hybridize. So speciation will not happen in the case of the right out. So just one word on the human rights because you are sitting here for human rights. Always remember pay blue dot perspective that I told you, right? We are just living the just one pixel, right? We are not uh, nothing so special about the earth. Like you, animals have rights too, plants and microbes too, mosquitoes and pathogenic microbes too. Non-living matter has its right to rivers, oceans, rivers, mountains, entire earth and universe all have its right. So how we are studying the climate, so I'm not just going there. So a number of evidences do directly suggest that the climate change is occurring. And the climate change in this Venn diagram is partly contributed by the man-made, that is anthropogenic activities, right? That is the climate change causing that, right? And this is what I call global warming. And some of this global warming are directly attributed to the human being. That is what man-made global warming here. So of course, there is a solid evidence of recent global warming due to mostly to the human activities such as the burning of the fossil fuel. I asked the question here in this uh, thing. So it's, it's directly linked to human being. But I say mostly because non-human being are also, you know, uh, activities not related to our own activities are also very important factors contributing in global warming. So if I say truth and belief, you know, what you believe is, you know, among, among the truth, only some truth you believe. 
pick up some truth in that what you call as knowledge. And that exactly is the problem with this climate change dialogue here, or even evolution dialogue. You have a tendency to believe in what you think is right. You will not take what others say is right. Right? That is exactly what the same thing confirmation bias I, I was telling before. Right? And this is my concluding slide. This last word is that I always wish that humanity stop being terrifically narrow-minded to seek advancement of our own lives. Right? Why this regarding other organisms co-inhabiting this planet and accept that all organisms have equal right to the welfare state that is our planet Earth. So this is my site, you can go there, you can download this presentation also and other links are there. And thank you very much.